I am, I am a faculty member at UNLV's uh, International Gaming Institute, which is an institute that looks at all aspects related to gaming on a global scale, from problem gaming to get to policy to economics regulation, and one of the more recent additions to the International Gaming Institute, the Center for Gaming Innovation, which I am the associate director. The Center for Gaming Innovation started four years ago. Uh, uh, as uh, it started by our, the executive director of our program, Mark Yoslov, who is the former CEO of ShuffleMaster, to see whether you could create sort of a class that could uh, inspire creative people to create new gambling products for the industry. Um, and that is really our main focus. And four years in, we are funded by the state of Nevada because, as you might guess the state of Nevada has an interest in innovation in gaming products. Um, we're funded by the state and the format of our class is very simple. We invite anyone to participate in our class. About half the class is composed of UNLV students and the other half of the class of 25 is really anybody from anywhere who just wants to come and participate in this program. We spend the first third of the class reviewing the fundamentals of gambling game design, the math the policy, the regulatory, uh, the, the regulations that govern uh, gambling games, um, and also look at the history of games that are successful. But the remainder of our class, two thirds of the class, is really devoted to inviting our students to come up to wow us with really creative new games that would work on the casino floor. Anything from table games to slot games to sports betting uh, to uh, utility products. About, about the same time that our program started is when people really start, when people first started talking about this concept of skill-based slots or the idea that slot games, the games, the machines in the casinos across the United States need to change the way that players interact with them in order to stay relevant and in order to, in order to acquire or attract new players uh, looking into the future. It's sort of interesting from my perspective because at the same time as uh, you know, gaming major gaming regulators and major legislative bodies, including Nevada and New Jersey, were beginning to amend their, their regulations governing slot machines to include more room for skill for player interaction and player decision making, my students were coming up with games and game concepts that had these elements of skill inserted in them. But the interesting thing is we weren't, we weren't asking them at that point to do that. We hadn't even mentioned the idea of skill-based loss. All we said was come up with something that interests you. And over and over again, we're getting people in their 20s and their early 30s giving us games that resemble or have elements of the casual mobile games they enjoy playing so much. You know, for, for this group, thinking about getting involved in the real money, brick and mortar casino business, game business may seem uh, foreign or, or perhaps a strange concept, but, uh, but it is still a very lucrative area to consider. $68 billion, that's how much win both commercial casinos and tribal casinos in the United States uh, collected in 2016. Now this includes all forms of gaming, including table games, but we can be pretty confident that machine gaming slots and other forms of electronic game machines represented uh, the, the biggest single share of this amount. Um, and there are currently 900,000 machines licensed uh, in the United States right now. So the numbers are there. Why this sudden push for skill-based slots in our industry? It's, 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 a, it's a fair question to ask. Um, and I think that the, the concern comes from a number of sources. One of, the, one of the concerns is simply the fact that the numbers for, um, for uh, slot revenue are somewhat flat. But also there are, these, there are significant concerns that demographic, sh demographic shifts, right, that the up and coming uh, players or, or casino uh, patrons uh, are not going to find the current slot play as appealing as those who are playing right now. Part of the problem, I think, is that we are seeing disruption from, quite frankly, the games that, uh, from mobile games, right? And the nature of those games and how the quality and the experience and the availability of those games on our devices is changing our expectations of what a game should be and what a game should feel like. Um, you know, mobile games, for the most part, are very active. 
they're continually inviting, not just mobile, but all video games, they are continually inviting players to continually interact with them to adapt their skill, adapt their strategy, improve, improve their ability to master whatever game mechanic is presented in front of them. If you're playing any kind of game, including a mobile game, you are generally always connected with that controller and always manipulating that controller. Contrast that with the controls for the traditional slot machine, which are enormously passive. Um, you know, these buttons, these buttons uh, worked 20 years ago and they still work today. Because really when you get right down to it, the only meaningful action that a player you engages in when they're playing a slot machine is the decision to make the wager. There are moments in, in many of the newer generations of machines where players might be asked to pick a, pick a basket or, or interact with the touch screen in some way. But even then, the outcome is already determined through a form of randomness. There is no really, there is no meaningful way for that player to engage or interact or change the outcome. So, the part of the reason why, not just me, but a lot of people, but certainly myself as well, were very, uh, you know, positive that, or very confident that skill-based slots can succeed, and we, and we are looking towards mobile game mechanics and mobile game styles, is because there are already a lot of similarities. You know, when you look at slot machines and how they work, how they, how, you know, how patterns align, randomly to form wing payouts, when you look at the graphics and the sound and the feel of the games. And then you look at many of the popular endless mobile games that are out there. I certainly see, and my students have seen too, elements, gameplay elements, gameplay mechanics that, might be, that, you, that we might be able to extract and combine with the fundamentals of, say, a class three wagering game to create not just a new gambling experience, but actually a new playing experience altogether. Something that, that exists really nowhere right now. That's not to say that slot machines haven't evolved over time. Certainly they have. And if, we, you know, if you compare a slot machine today to a slot machine from 20 years ago or 30 years ago, they have gotten bigger, they have gotten bolder, they have gotten louder. We see more symbols, we see bigger screens, we see video clips and movies interspersed with them. Um, but at the end of the day, the fundamental game mechanic, while the play out of the result of that game mechanic might be more involved and more exciting and, and have some emotionally stimulating graphics and sound, uh, it's still very much a passive activity. Um, and I think one other point I want to quickly make is that when we look at, say, uh, you know, scientific games, Wonka machines, you know, where they have expanded the number of bonuses, they've expanded the number of reels and the number of lines and pay lines and crazy wilds pop up when you have a winning spin. You know, many of the advancements we've seen in slot machines over the last 15, 20 years have been tailored towards improving or giving current slot players what they want, right? If you like more action, if you like more lines, if you like more wilds, if you like more bonuses, we can build that into our current model and give that to you. But the question is, have we now reached a point where to those who do not already have a, a pre-existing appreciation or enjoyment of slot machines, are we still delivering an enjoyable gaming experience? Okay, so I want to very briefly talk about what I think are sort of some of the fundamental principles that in these early stages of inserting skill into slots that designers need to consider. I think the first thing that you're always gonna have to consider if you want to develop a real money gambling game that has more elements of skill inserted into it is the balance between the player's, ac you know, the player's ability to exercise skill, whether that skill is identifying patterns, predicting patterns, manipulating shapes, matching things, uh, acting quickly to you know, grab the red ball instead of the green ball or aiming and shooting at stuff. There's a wide range of mechanics that we can employ. The question is, how do they work with the fundamental random base that drives slot play? Um, you know, the nature of slot machines is such that the experience of slot play has to follow certain principles. You know, in order to have winners, you need to have a significant number of losers. Um, and let's not forget the fact that slot machines need to deliver a uh, mathematically certifiable return to the house, uh, the house win. So that, I think, is part of the biggest challenge. Now, why I think that we can do this is because some of the most popular gambling games in existence today have elements of skill, offer players the chance to learn, to improve, and to exercise skill and strategy 
to improve their win, improve their chances of having a winning hand. You know, three excellent examples are blackjack, Texas Hold'em poker, and I would also include video poker. Uh, and, and all three of those games are giants, extraordinarily popular in gambling in America today. So I want to very briefly go over uh, three principles right, that I have sort of noticed in the work I've done with my students as, we've tried, as we have tried to build or insert skill into slots. Principle number one, I think it's still important to embrace gambling and embrace the fact that this is a gambling game more than it is a casual game. It's producing different emotions and it has a different logic that's driving it. So when I say embrace gambling, I mean embrace everything about gambling, the chance and randomness right, that exists in gambling, the fact that you are engaging in an exercise, if we're talking about real money gambling, of risk. Right, that can produce losing outcomes, winning outcomes, and all of those streaks, both good and bad, winning streaks, losing streaks, ping pong scenarios where you're up, you're down, you're up, you're down, all of that unpredictability coupled with the very real rewards that a successful slot play can produce create what I believe is a really unique psychological, emotional, and, and even physiological experience. Um, and the question is, by giving people new skills, new opportunities to perhaps improve the outcome of a randomly delivered set of, of figures or, or outcomes through the exercise of skill, to see yourself improving over time, can that create a totally new gaming experience that we hope will uh, bring uh, uh, will appeal to both current, play, to current gamblers, but also will attract newer gamblers into the casino. One last point I'd like to make about embracing gambling. You know, I think it's very important if you're going to insert skill elements, whatever those elements are, that it is clear in the way the game is presented to the player, what is the skill and what is the chance element of the game. Don't try to bury or, or obscure a bad deal by, by covering or hiding it up in a skill mechanic, right? You know, the, I, I think ultimately if it's gonna succeed, the player needs to understand whether they've received a great hand or a bad hand, a great starting deal or a, or a bad starting deal. I'm using the word deal even though, I'm using the word deal even though I'm talking about game mechanics that don't necessarily involve playing cards. And the extent to which they can then use the skill that's available to them to maximize their payout, maximize the probability of winning. And certainly, we have lots of symbols that already exist today that easily connotate randomness, right, uh, that might be useful to insert in any, in any skill-based game that you're creating. Uh, point number two, I think that speed still matters. You know, uh, slot play is, you know, the wagering is very fast in slot play. And I know that there's a tendency for us to think, well, that's because the casino wants that. And the casino does want that, right? It's true, that is an important thing for the casino, the speed of wagering, the number of spins per hour. Um, but this is not just an issue for the casino. I also believe that the speed of wagering is also important to the player. And I think one of the risks we have when we try to insert skill into slots is skill means the player is doing something, right? It might be a shooting game and you've got some sort of shooting dynamic um, and the player and it takes extra seconds, you know, maybe 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 20 seconds for the player to utilize those mechanics as part of the playing exercise. But the problem is this. The problem is we know that, you know, the majority of the wagers that are made in a slot game are going to produce a, shall we say, meh result, right? At least in terms of the winning or losing the payout. Um, and it has to be that way. There's going to be losing. There's going to be small wins. Um, we also know that you know, we can't control, as, the program, as people who are designing class three wagering games, we can't control specifically when you're going to get a, a great win, a great hand, a satisfying hand. Every, the outcome of every wager is independent of the other ones. So if we, if we force players to spend too much time, uh, if, we, if we force players to spend too much time um, on you know, exercising their skill, on wagers where we know they don't have a very strong, there's really no chance of them winning anything, anything more than maybe a few credits, you know, half their bet back. Not only are we reducing the likelihood that the player will then trigger a bonus, a spin that actually affords them the opportunity to use skill 
in a way that produces those, those high return payouts or even medium return payouts that they want. This is just a quick graph that I, that I put together. It's not based on actual data, but slot machines today use that dynamic, right? In that, you know, losing spins are usually over very quickly. Eh, you lost, let's move on to the next spin. But those few spins that involve a, a, a relatively high payback, say 10 times, 20 times, 30 times the initial wager, usually those are coupled with bonus games, second screen bonus games, free spins. Now we're dragging out the process because the player wants to engage that particular wager for a longer period of time. All right. Uh, lastly, I'm, I'm really just going to, because we're almost out of time, I'm just going to briefly say that if, you know, another area, I've been talking mostly about house bank machines, but I also think it's important to think about uh, the potential for competitive gambling games. This might be the future, and in competitive gambling games, the math is a little easier because the house is more, it, the house just takes a fixed rake, right, and, the, and, you know, multiple people compete against each other and the winner takes all, most or all of the prize. Um, the challenge there, of course, is creating a game that balances the super skilled players with the less skilled players in order to ensure that you have a healthy population base that wants to engage the game. If you, if you um, develop a game where the skill component is too high and the chance component is too low, you're going to scare away new players, you're going to scare away less experienced or less skillful players, no one's going to feel that they're going to have a chance, and you're going to wind up with a game that just doesn't have a population sufficient to, to support it. The example I always use is Texas Hold'em Poker, which I think is, I cannot think of a game that has a better balance of skill and chance in order to ensure that people of all skill levels, of all abilities, can play it, enjoy it, and think that they're playing a fair game. Okay, very lastly, I want to talk about the pathway that we try to encourage our students to follow and if they want to develop a gambling game and, and make money off of it. I, just, I have this picture of the Klondike up just because I want to emphasize that I really do believe that we are on the cusp of dramatic transformation like in gambling in so many ways. However, um, and there's, a, you know, certain companies, certain people, they're going to develop the new game formats that may very well redefine what gambling is for the next 20 years and be the next popular must-have, must-play games. And there's a lot of money in that. But like the Klondike, very few people are going to get rich. A lot of people are going to go home with nothing, and some people are going to die. Um, so, <laughs> not to be bleak, but there is def I am not here saying, oh, it's, it's a sure bet, go into it. You have to be aware of the risks, that this is a high risk, high reward endeavor if you're a small to mid-sized studio, particularly if you've never been involved in gambling games before. So what is the process that we encourage our students to follow and that we help them with in my class? First, it starts with a, with a great concept. Is it new? Is it fun? Does it make sense? Next, we, next, my argument would be after you've established that you have a great concept, do the patent work. Patenting is a big part of uh, casino games, filing patents and, you, and selling those patents. Not only will a patent give, give you some protection, but it will also tell you if the game you are working on and spending energy with, on may already be covered by a patent. You may be infringing on a patent and that will help you not waste time and money in developing something that you might be locked out of. You have to do the math, right? You have to make sure you're very compliant. You have to build it, which of course is your strength, right? Being able to take all the skills and tools you have at making these wonderful fun games and, and building a, a, a version that, that really shows the potential. And then if you're really looking to get into what either the emerging online gaming market in the United States or a, a brick and mortar casino, you're gonna have to find a licensed distributor to partner with you to distribute the game um, because, uh, you know, to cover costs like certification, licensing fees, uh, offer the cabinet on which it would be uh, portrayed, uh, and so on. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I've really enjoyed the opportunity to uh, speak with you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Thank you for your, uh, the talk. It was very informative. I just have one quick question. Uh, in uh, Nevada regs today, uh, are there minimums and maximums that uh, skill base can contribute to the RTP? Um, I think that the ratio that we always talk about is 70-30, right? But it, it's more tricky than that, right? Because 
the, the, you know, casinos, you know, the, the industry wants games to be somewhat predictable. So you wouldn't want a game where you're expecting the average player to maybe be playing at a return of 88%, 88% of all the money wagered return to the player, you know, with it being theoretically capped at 98%, like only the best players would, but then you find out that a lot of people are playing at 76, 75% return to player, that might wind up being an issue. Um, we're in very early stages. You know, there have only been a handful of these so-called next generation, very different slot concepts that have hit actual casino floors uh, in, in, in the United States today. So that's, it's, it's, but it's definitely something that does need to be considered. Well, once again, Daniel, thank you so much. It's a great talk.